Good evening, everyone. Time for another silver update. We're actually going to start off not with the silver chart, but we're going to start off with the U.S. dollar Mexican peso chart. Um, recent news has been that you, uh, Mexico held an election, elected a new president. She's apparently a Jewish socialist. I haven't done the research. It's big trending on TikTok and I certainly don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But uh, just for the purposes of silver, because that's going to be the main topic always. But the movement in the peso is kind of interesting. So we'll pull in because that was just a long view. Uh, the 10 minute doesn't work. But let's go to a one hour view. And you can see this rally in the chart. Now this is going from a high number down to a low number. So we touched 19 pesos to the dollar. And we were sitting at, uh, what were we sitting at? Fairly recently we were sitting at 16. So that's, let's get in a closer view. I, I think that's too extreme. Yeah, so that's a that's a big move in a currency if you think about it. Um, so what does that portend? Well, it could be a number of things. We have to keep in mind that Mexico is, if not the biggest, I just recently saw the top three. I can't remember where Mexico was in that. It was some silver research I was doing. But Mexico was in the top three, if not number one, silver miners in the world. So what happens in Mexico is pretty important because uh, if a lot of the silver is coming out of there and they decide to nationalize, it's always going to be, not, I'm going to do another video on the miners, um, just to briefly state, I've given my opinion many times on miners, I think they're a really bad investment. Um, Anytime you invest in something where the price is being artificially suppressed of the commodity that you create, that puts you in a really bad situation. Why would you want to be in that? That's one of the worst businesses. You're in a business that's operating under price controls. It's like running a 7-Eleven and they tell you you got to sell your burritos for a dollar. Um, that's just a really bad situation. So I don't know why anybody would want to do that. But um, having these price controls uh, on silver causes the miners to either operate at a loss or uh, just barely get by. Uh, so that's the first reason you don't want to own miners. The second reason you don't want to own miners is this right here, the, the possibility of nationalization. Uh, what are the odds of the socialist uh, sort of hero to the people? I, I don't know what the number. I thought the numbers were really high. Like, I, I mean, who knows? Elections are probably all fake, and they're probably all robots. You know, I don't know. But uh, the reported numbers were like uh, sixty-five to eighty percent of the vote, or something. And then there's all this controversy on TikTok about supposedly assassinations. I mean, Mexico is a crazy place. But uh, if you get a real popular socialist in there and uh, she's a woman of the people, uh, there's no reason why uh, it has happened so many times in the past why they wouldn't decide to nationalize the mines, especially during a price spike or, say, a critical infrastructure shortage, uh, whether that be solar or electric vehicles or something like that that would be perfect reason to do that so that's the second reason why miners are a big risk i i uh i have purchased some i purchased purchased a little bit of uh, first majestic just because i like keith newmeyer uh when it was super duper low uh let's see what is that ag i already flipped out of it but uh yeah, it got Yeah, recently I I put some of my retirement money into it around in here. 
especially when I first, when I saw this first green up, I was thinking, looking at the price of silver, looking at the price of the stock, yeah, I think this one's going to run. But that was just in an IRA that uh, it's just kind of a trading account. But so I have, that's, a, that's about the only miner I've ever purchased. And that was really a trade. Um, because, you know, not that I don't love Keith Newmeyer, he's a great guy, but being in a business where the, it's official government policy to suppress your prices is, like I said, it's like selling burritos required at a dollar and you're going to go out of business. Um, so, but back to the Mexican peso, uh, that's just another reason why we might see less silver coming online. Uh, or something strange could happen like them cutting a deal uh, with, uh, say, China. Uh, we know that Mexico sends a lot of finished Chinese goods due to tariffs, uh, direct Chinese tariffs that I think Trump put in place, but Biden either increased or continued. Uh, but uh, due to the tariffs... A lot of the stuff is shipped into Mexico, assembled there, and then brought into the United States. Um, so, you know, the Chinese have a decent presence in Mexico already. Why, why wouldn't Mexico set up a deal with China and just send their silver over there? Cut the COMEX right out of the loop. That's another one, you know, you have to keep in mind. So enough on that, uh, because I want to get to uh, uh, this silver thread on Reddit that I, I want to talk about. Uh, a question that came up on one of the videos about the melt. But before I do that, I want to look at some charts because uh, I've got charts that I've been doing this whole time. So a lot of my lines are in place. And one that really jumped out at me recently was the U.S. two-year. Um, so you can see, let's you know go way back to the, I guess 1989, it says. It only goes back to 89. But you can see the long, long bull market in bonds or bear market in rates. This is a chart of rates. So um, it's the opposite of bond prices. So if you come in and go to the daily, you can see here, these are the trend lines that I've drawn in for the two-year and this is at least rumored to be amongst supposed people who are in the know that, that argue that the Fed is not really in control of rates. I wouldn't consider myself someone in that school. I think the Fed is in control of rates. But the people who say that the Fed follows, this is what they say they follow, the two-year. And you can see the tremendous bull market in interest rates. I mean, the two-year sat at 0% from just mid-2020 and all the way into 2022. I thought it was longer than that, but that's a two-year, remember, going down to virtually nothing. And we're all the way up now at 4.7%. So I would say just looking at this chart, I would say we need to draw in some trend lines because what I'm seeing here is some kind of pennant forming up. I would probably want to catch these three. They look to be lining up and probably line it up with a third or fourth down here. So I draw it like this. Doesn't seem to be fitting in. We didn't touch it below, maybe like this. But probably I would pull it up here and say this is kind of the trend. We might have to pull it down a little bit. We're just trying to get an idea of what's forming up. And then I would draw another one at the top of the flag from this price top here. So, yeah, rising pennant, I don't know. Not a very pretty formation. Not anything I would... Uh, make any bets on but it does look pretty long in the tooth it does look like it may be rolling over we'll just pull out maybe to the weekly uh the indicator now the indicators are scary let's pull out to the monthly okay so you can see that that's just the indicator absolutely blew out 
to the 15, 16,000 level, just unheard of levels in the indicator because the, the, it was such a fierce, uh, I promise this will be the last thing I'll say about this. It was such a fierce rally in interest rates. I don't know what was going on from why the Fed just went absolutely nuts. Uh, or was it the market that forced their hand that you, you be the judge? But the rapidity of these rates, there, there's simply no way that you can convince, actually, we want to go to the 10 year, uh, because that's a more important rate. And that's what a lot of these banks are sitting on. So the rapidity of the rate rises, you can see the 10 year going from in 2020, basically from under half a percent all the way up to four and a half percent. So, you know, people, People were buying ten-year note, uh, ten-year notes, here. Uh, buying government debt, loaning money to the government, the spendthrift government, for half a percent. Yeah, that's that's a really bad deal. Um, and but there are apparently a lot of banks that did it. Who knows? Hedge funds, retirement funds. We don't know. It's got, it has to be marked to market, or will it have to be marked to market? That's a big issue. Uh, that was the issue that came up with SBB and these other banks and all these other things is uh, are, do you force these things to be marked to market? Because if you have a bond that's paying a half a percent interest rate and current rates are four and a half percent, how much value did that bond lose? The 80, 90 percent of the value? It, it's, a, it's a tremendous loss. It's an unbelievable loss. So the the point I was making is why the Fed did the rapidity of it's never raised rates this fast in the past. Um, so it kind of almost intentionally put the banking sector in trouble, but maybe their hand was forced. I don't know, but they should have raised earlier. They shouldn't have gone to zero. They should have raised at a quarter point and kept raising until they normalized rates, which would be five, six, seven percent, maybe a flat yield curve at five, six, seven percent. That's historically, but we know they can't do that because of the national debt. So I could ramble on forever. But let's jump over what we're going to talk about the main story, this thread on Reddit. And this is our silver bugs, uh, which is one I just found today. I was doing some research on some other stuff, but I found this one. And this is an interesting post by Floppy Snoogles. And he says, uh, here's my 500 ounces. I'm just waiting for the spot price to hit $34 to unload. So uh, I, it was really coincidental that this uh, popped up because I was, you know, wanting to look at uh, local coin shops. Uh, it's either too, too big or too small. Let's get this in. Okay. So it looks like they're tubes of silver American eagles. Uh, I can't tell what these yellow ones are. I thought those were, I don't know. Oh, those are maples, yeah. So, the, I mean, this is a pretty nice collection here. You got some one ounce rounds. You got some Atmex uh, sealed, uh, you know, I mean, pretty nice. Uh, but, you know, if you've ever sold silver back, and I've done it many times, uh, whether it was just not usually trying to take a profit, but if, uh, you know, needed some cash or something, I've sold silver back. And you're almost always going to get below spot. And the, the big issue that's going to come up here is uh, how much is melted, because that's what we were talking about in another thread of... You know, how much actually gets melted when it goes back to the local coin shop. And that's what I want to kind of think about here. And then, and then a further issue is going to be how does that melted silver that does get melted, how does it feed back into the system? Now, we know that 1,000 ounce bars is the big uh, well, 5,000 ounce, but 5,000 and 5,000 ounce bars are the, uh, I think it's, are there 5,000, there may be 5,000 ounce bars, but, but the COMEX contracts are delivering these big 1,000 ounce bars, so you get five of those. How much is this melted back into those bars? Goes, can go back to the COMEX. Now we know right now, uh, let's go over to Provident. 
Uh, by the way, d while doing research with this, I did find that JM Bullion had purchased Providence. So I was just doing price comparisons on rounds, and I noticed that the payment options were exactly the same because they both have this little payment option here saying get a 3% discount off the list price when you buy using, and here are the cryptos, BTC, BCH, ETH, WBTC, that's wrapped Bitcoin, Doge, LTC, and five USD peg stable coins. So there's five five stable coins. I'm sure USDT is one, USDC is another, but so that's a pretty interesting uh, variety there. So in theory, now I went to the buyback page and I can't remember if it was JM Bullion or Provident, but I didn't find a buyback page for crypto. It was cash or check. But it'd be interesting to see if this guy could sell his his silver, um, ship it to one of these guys and, and request payment in, in Bitcoin. I don't see why not. You can buy with Bitcoin. Why shouldn't you be able to sell it for Bitcoin? What does that mean? How do you tax that transaction? Who knows? Crazy. But that's not the issue here. Uh, let's read some of the comments and then um, talk a little bit, bit about the melt. Um, so this guy says, if it breaks 34, it's going to 40, so you need to hold. <laughs> and now, by the way, I don't know why this guy's selling. I mean, there's plenty of reasons people can sell. He may be somebody who thinks it's going to go down. He, he may be somebody that has to sell. It doesn't sound like he has to sell because he's waiting for a price. Maybe he has, uh, like, you know, 5,000 ounces that he stacked over the years. And he started stacking at 4 bucks. And he's just culling out the stuff he doesn't want. I've done that. I've culled out stuff I didn't want. I culled out my spotty maple leaves. I really didn't like them. I picked a bunch of maple leaves. Uh, I think there were 2010 maple leaves I picked up. And they started milk spotting right away. So I, I can't remember if I dumped them or traded them or something. But yeah, they, uh, you know, it happened. So this might be a guy that has, you know, 5,000 ounces and he... Uh, just decided is to take a profit at 34. Uh, now, another thing that this brings up is how many of you would be willing, you know, obviously not right now, but, you know, let's see, what does it cost you to pick this up? So, so to pick up this, this silver round, silver town, I just used the Buffalo silver town round because it's pretty much the standard uh, one ounce. If you're talking one ounce round, this is the one uh, that everybody knows and uh, multiple people uh, do it. I guess just because it looks like the Buffalo Nickel and that's really popular, but this is one I've owned, bought and sold, and it's well recognized. Uh, so to get this on a credit card, if you're going to get, you know, a small amount, let's just do the small amounts. Let's say, you know, $34.51. Uh, if you buy it with crypto, you can get, you know, let's say you're buying 100. Let's say you're buying is 500 right here, 100 through 499. Uh, well, let's just go to the 500 plus. So we're talking, you know, 34 bucks there for, for credit card payment. Um, 33 or so for crypto payment and almost 33 for uh, the big break here is uh, paying check or cash bank wire uh, for over 500. But still, you're talking 33 to 34 bucks. So somebody could just step up and pay this guy 34 bucks a coin. Um, I mean, it'd have to be an in-person transaction, I guess. But I mean, there's some tubes of eagles. There's tubes, multiple tubes of maples. So, you know, that might happen. But that's not what I'm interested in at this point. What I'm interested in right now is what's going to happen to the silver? So let's say silver hits 34 bucks. This guy goes down to local coin store. Okay, what are you paying? We're paying 50 cents under spot. Okay, spot's 34.50 right now. Okay, how many you got? 500 ounces. All right, 34 bucks an ounce. Boom. The local coin store guy buys it. What happens to it? Well, we know right now that uh, this is why I went over to this round. We're over on the silver chart. We're at 29.50. So what's that? 
four bucks above spot, five bucks above spot. Um, so yeah, uh, the guy gets 34 bucks, let's say, and what's that guy in the coin store going to do? How much demand is he going to have for random one ounce rounds? People want maple leaves at this particular thing. I mean, it's, it's just not going to happen. Does he have a secondary guy that he sells it to? Maybe. Most likely, it's going to go to melt. Going to go to melt. So let's look at melt. This is uh, NGC. Sorry. Coin melt values. And yeah, NGC. And so you can see it has all the interesting ones. It's kind of cool to see, you know, what your good old Roosevelt dime. The melt on that right now is two dollars and fourteen cents. So still two bucks. Uh, you can't get it for that, but you know that's what you're going to get for it if it goes for melt. So that shows a mercury dime. Wow, two bucks. That's so cheap. It's only twenty times the face. That's incredible. Um, but the melt now on American Silver Eagles, twenty nine sixty two. So, you know, the guy is going to get that. That's what he's going to get when he sends it to the smelter. So he's probably going to pay you less than that. So he'll pr probably pay you right now $29. Uh, when it's $34, maybe, maybe you'll get $34. So it's going to melt. And I think that's my point. The reason why that, why I brought that up was because uh, someone in the comments was talking about how many silver eagles are out there. Now, the estimates are around 650 million since the beginning of the program. I think it was 1986. So, but how many have been melted? Uh, I mean, I'm going to go into next time. Uh, well, I don't have it up here, but I'm going to take a look next time at the history of the Morgan dollar. And there was an act passed at World War One where the Americans bailed out the British because the British had uh, backed these fake silver certificates, sold them to India, and the Indians were demanding real silver, and the British didn't have any, of course. <laughs> So uh, they took uh, 300 million Morgan silver dollars from the United States and shipped it over there and funded it. And that's how they beat Germany in World War One, or one of the ways they beat Germany in World War One. So, you know, there's a history of that. But my question is, how many of these silver eagles that have been minted have been melted? I think the number's high. Uh, by the way, of the Morgans, it was like 300 million ounces they, they melted. But uh, how many eagles have been melted? I don't know, but I know the ones that go back to the coin shop are getting melted. I think it would be a high guess, but not too high. I would say 50% have already been melted. I know that seems crazy, uh, but that's just the gut feeling I get. If that's the case, then there's only 325 million silver eagles in existence. Think about that. 325 million total number of silver eagles. What's that in dollars? Too low to even think about, right? So, another thing I wanted to cover is, uh, this came across when I was doing research today, about silver ownership. So there's a little breakdown. The title of the article is, how much gold and silver do you have to be have to own to be in the top 1%? And it goes through gold and all that stuff. And ultra high net worth individuals. I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about silver. So this comment on silver. The silver bullion and global ownership distribution is even more striking. Apparently gold is striking. This is more striking. How much silver... You have to own to be in the top 1% of its owners. It's estimated that global silver bullion supply is about 4 billion. Okay, here's 4 billion. I said yes or the other day, $5 billion. They're saying $4 billion. Global silver bullion supply is $4 billion, out of which J.P. Morgan and a few other large bullion banks hold $1 billion ounces. I don't know. I don't know if J.P. Morgan has any silver. Hope they do. Maybe they'll try to drive it up a thousandfold. 
Uh, but ultra, if ultra, ultra high net worth individual population, each worth at least $30 million, owns on average 1,000 ounces of silver, that's that's just a single biggest bar together. They own 0.5 billion ounces. The millionaires group with 50 million people needs to own just 50 ounces of silver per person to grasp the remaining 2.5 billion ounces. Since their 50 ounces is average, their typical ownership most likely ranges from 20 to 500 ounces. This indicates, and here's the big upshot, this indicates that only 20 ounces of silver bullion puts you in the top 1% of stackers. Wow. I hope this guy at least keeps 20. I think he's probably got a lot more than that. But if you just keep 20 ounces, you're in the top 1%. Incredible. What an under-owned asset. So like I said, uh, it's very interesting that the crypto that's being used or accepted, by the way, I checked AppMex, AppMex, I could not find where AppMex was accepting anything but Bitcoin. I think that was the case. Uh, SD Bullion, I didn't check. But Bullion for crypto is a, definitely a, a doable thing and it has a discount. But uh, so the last question, oh, the other point I wanted to make is that premiums on physical silver are very, very good right now. There, there have been times where they're very bad. There's a big supply relative to what we've seen in the past. Now, why is that? Well, because this is just the little guy stacking silver. And right now, the little guy's in trouble. Um, so this is just what feeds back and forth at, at the fringes of things. What's driving the price of silver is not um, people buying at their local coin shop or people buying from Amex. It's solar and things like that. It's industrial uses of silver. Uh, the question is, and this is, this is the big question, how does this selling in the local coin shops feed back in and what price is going to draw back in that much silver? Now, apparently, for whatever reason, uh, this guy has decided to sell. And I'm pretty much 100% convinced that 100% of this will go to melt. If we hit $34, he sells a local coin shop. This is all going to melt. I don't know. Post your opinions uh, below or your knowledge. Or There's a lot of guys with YouTube channels that are local coin store owners. They can tell you a lot more. Uh, I can't think of the channel names offhand, but there's a number of them out there that have their own silver channels that are local coin star owners. But, you know, how will this actually feed back in? I, I don't see... Uh, oh, yeah, the other thing I wanted to add was how much... I was looking to see how much is in the hands of the ordinary citizen. Um... But I don't know. Uh, does the United States hold the majority of this bullion form silver? If there's that much out there. Maybe a quarter of it. Um, probably not even that. So how much is out there in coin form that silver stackers hold? Let's just say it's a billion ounces. I guess that's one year's mining supply. Uh, one year's... Uh, manufacturing and investment usage so that would supply one year what does the price have to go to to pull those away to get those back to melt because remember um, like I was looking at one of my favorites that I purchased quite a while back it's a 2007 Australian koala series and uh, I'll go ahead and end on this um, so 2007, obviously I bought it quite a long time ago. I think when you, and it's in the plastic casing, but when you look it up, I think it says $109 or something on eBay. And, you know, you can find prices here and there, but uh, there aren't any sites that list them. I think there's maybe one site on the internet that has one or something for 150 bucks. Pretty much 
doesn't exist anywhere. So uh, you're not too likely to sell that for melt uh, unless you get an extreme, just a really extreme move. So I don't know if you remember, but from in the past when I was doing videos on, you know, what I liked, and of course here we're looking at, you know, the buffalo. But what I liked in the past when I was really interested in it was Perth Mint, one of the reasons why is it wasn't that much higher than the the difference between spot and an eagle, say, or the difference between spot and a maple. And it just seemed to me that there was a much more likely chance that it was going to become a collector coin and have that much more premium on it. And what's the advantage of that premium? Um, people are like, well, you got to find a, you, you're going to sell all your coins on eBay, or you're going to sell them, uh, you know, to try to find the collector, or something like that. But that's actually not the biggest advantage. The biggest advantage of buying what you bet or thinking is going to be a semi numismatic play like um, that coin. Let's pull it up real quick. It's uh, 2007 Koala. That'll probably pull it out. Cool. Z. So here's an eBay. Oh, wow. I thought it was more than that. Oh, that's a 2007. Okay, so it's 55. I think I was thinking of the Tiger. Uh, but so it's $55 for the 2007. Yeah. And this next one is 79. I don't know. You know, it's eBay prices. They're all over the place. You probably want to go in and look for sold and... I don't ever mess with eBay. But so the advantage, if you're talking about a coin like that, and really advantage with, uh, you know, even what this guy was selling, is that if it's hard to sell, if if you have to take a loss, uh, if it, you have to sell for, you don't, much less than you think it's worth, then you do everything you can to not. And that's the best, the best thing you can do because silver is is a long-term uh, safety uh, prepping type of um, investment. You're not flipping. Flipping physical silver has got to be the dumbest thing anybody could ever think of doing. The premiums are going to cut you to ribbons both ways. So that's not, that's not what silver stackers, uh, almost all of them, are, are doing. They're not trying to flip silver for... And in it, and if you find yourself, I, I know there's emergencies that happen, and everybody has emergencies in their life. So I'm not making any judgments about anything like that. But for the most part, um, silver stackers are not looking to uh, flip them ten dollars away, and and that gets back to the overhead resistance, because we talked about that before when we were looking at the chart. Uh, where is the overhead resistance and how does the overhead resistance feed back into the price setting mechanism that's on the COMEX? And I would argue that I don't think it really does at all. It's just they're two totally separate animals. Um, this is just a little teeny tiny sandbox where the ordinary Joe gets to play. And as soon as um, the music stops, then that's just going to just going to shut down. Like I pointed out the other day, that 1.5 million ounces or whatever's held in the local coin stores and all the online stores added together, this can evaporate. Some guy can scribble out a check and it's gone. So right now it's just a little tiny sandbox that uh, the little guy can play in. It's certainly not in his interest to um, flip his coins and um, there's there's just not much out there. And I'd be interested, you know, put in the comments what you uh, would be tempted to start selling back into the market to the coin stores to get melted. Uh, what price you would be a temptation for you to start selling back to them. And we'll talk to you next time.